I will uh, move forward to, to my next uh, guest. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm going to present uh, him. Uh, it's about uh, Jonas uh, Arn. Um, he's an uh, old friend of, uh, of us uh, from, uh, from Germany. Um, the, as I, I uh, met him a few years ago when we were students uh, in, uh, in the summer schools, uh, I knew a bit more about uh, um, how he was uh, starting his career. And um, I think I can mention here that uh, he was doing planning for, uh, for uh, five years in a, a big uh, uh, landscape uh, planning office in uh, Berlin. And um, after five years, he decided to go on sites to see the planning and uh, the results of his work. And he was really disappointed of this. Uh, so he decided to quit his job there and find his way uh, and do more uh, something that he's more passionate about. Uh, so he joined NABU Foundation, which is uh, uh, a foundation that uh, was opened by NABU. Uh, NABU is, uh, um, I don't know, a cluster probably, I'm assuming, uh, which is, uh, um, which realized uh, uh, almost one century ago, or more than one century ago, uh, that for protecting lands, uh, for protecting the environment, uh, they need to do something more. Uh, so they decided to buy land, to buy the, uh, the natural parks from Germany. Uh, and then uh, they opened NABU Foundation uh, in uh, 1999. Uh, and now NABU Foundation uh, is uh, taking care of these areas. Uh, we are talking about uh, uh, one, 156,000 uh, area, uh, hectares of uh, land, as I, I remember. I hope I'm rem remembering it well. Um, Jonas also uh, finished uh, his studies on environmental uh, protection. Uh, so I'm going to invite him uh, to tell us more about his experience on working uh, um, up, up in, in this uh, uh, type of environment, uh, working with uh, the uh, ecosystem services. So uh, Jonas, uh, your stage, the stage is yours, please. Jonas, the, cam the microphone, please. We couldn't hear you. Now? Now it's perfect. Yeah. Thank you. Good luck. Bună ziua! Sunt foarte fericit că am fost invitat la această conferință. Din păcate, română mea nu este încă suficient de bună pentru să susține relegerea în limba română, mai trebuie să aflu mai multe, așa că voi continua în engleză acum. <laughs> Can you see the screen? My screen? So, I want to go wild with you now and show you the importance of wilderness areas and landscape planning. So, for the first, what is wilderness? Um, probably everybody has an image of wilderness, but there is no clear definition. So I'm sure such kind of forests are counted as wilderness areas. But also wetlands, like this moor, it's a bit more mystic. And in the wilderness community, there's also a discussion going on if meadows can be counted as wilderness areas due to um, the time, let's say 10,000 years ago before or during the last ice age when big mammals, herds of big mammals, mammals um, traveled throughout our continent. Um, so some wilderness peoples, people also count meadows into wilderness. They all have, in general, um, the aspect, let's say, little influence of human beings. Uh, why is that important now in this conference? Um, we talk about urban spaces 
Is it right? So I think it's about the web of nature. We heard a lot in the last presentations also yesterday. And I want to show you that everything is connected and in nature and water seems to be the key. The, the things I present you are scientific hard stuff. Let's say new facts of the last few decades. It was a big development, a big knowledge that we got in the last decade. I want to give you one example for urban connection to wilderness areas. Here you see a map of um, New York City and its water supply system. So in 1991, the uh, EPA, that is the Environmental Protection Agency in the US, um, they said the city needs a filter system for drinking water because the water quality was um, declining. The estimated costs had been 8 billion years to build it and then 300 million dollars each year to keep it, to remain it. So in 1997, the New York City Department decided to go another um, way. They invested $2 billion to protect forests and wetlands um, and to transform the land use in the area you see above um, to an eco-friendly way. Today, more than 10, people, 10 million people get their drinking water of dead reservoirs and um, it's naturally filtered surface water. So it's not groundwater like in most of the other mm, mm, uh, cities in the world. This is really surface water. The area provides 6.8 billion liters water each day. And the water comes from 250 um, uh, km um, to the city and without any technical aids, it goes up to the sixth floor of each building. So in this example, you can see that a city and the natural forests have been woven into the network and now they protect each other on a long-term scale. They are dependent on each other. So let's go to the incredible network of nature. I want to ask the question, because we talked a lot about trees, what is a tree? Here, yeah. let's compare wild trees and urban trees. Here you see that urban tree. And the wild tree facts are, normally trees live in symbiosis with fungi. They communicate with each other. They share nutrients and information. They raise and teach their children. They can live hundreds of years. They provide habitats. A good old Bacchus robur, for example, is home for more than 1,000 species. Of course, trees filter and store water and they store carbon dioxide for a long time. They grow slowly. The density and quality of the wood is different if they grow slowly, if they grow in the shade or in the forest in comparison to the um, singular trees. And they even let it rain in Timishwara. So here you can see <clears throat> Timishwara. The new scientific data shows that the rainfalls only go 300, uh, about 300 kilometers. The, the number um, is not fixed. Let's say if maybe it's 200, maybe 400 kilometers, but around that, um, only the clouds come from the coastline 300 km inside the continent. So after 300 km, rain is produced by the forests. And if you put a circle around Timishwara, you see that there is no coastline in 300 km distance. So even the rain in Timishwara is produced by trees or let's say by forests. 
in general, approximately 90% of the water that reaches the atmosphere of our planet over the continents comes from our forests. You can see here clear cut area in Romania. It's in the Carpathian Mountains. And you maybe can imagine that this has an effect even on rainfall far away. I have an advice uh, a suggestion for a book, um, The Hidden Life of Trees of a German forester, Peter Wohlleben. He's discussed controversial, of course, but he shows in his book recent scientific findings and combines it with personal experience. He also speaks about the wood wide web. So the wood wide web means the connection in between trees uh, in forests. And to a conclusion, he says the fungi play an important role. And maybe you can Ask yourself, where and when do you collect mushrooms? Here you see a good variety. Normally, when I go uh, um, to search for fungis, I do it after the rain and in the old forest. Here you can see a world map of the mucoriza. So let, let's easily say the roots of the um, mushroom and fungi. They are mainly found in the moist um, parts, so in the parts that show hot and wet climates. Another suggestion of mine for a book is Fantastic Fungi from the god of fungi himself. Uh, he's called, uh, his name is Paul Stamets. You can see him below in the picture. And a nice fun fact is the hat that he wears is made of fungi leather and it is produced in Transylvania, the only place I know that um, where people do leather of fungi. Maybe some more facts about the fungi. The largest living creature on this planet is a fungi. Fungi in general are the third kingdom of higher developed organisms. So they are not plants, they are not animals. They are the third kingdom. As I said, the largest living creature is a fungi. It's called the Michigan Halimash, and it covers about 150,000 square meters. And the estimated weight is 600 tons. Imagine that is four times the weight of a blue whale, the biggest animal. Well, Sam has estimates about 1.5 million species of fungi in the world. Only 10% have a head like him. The fungi are masters of symbiosis. They normally live with, especially with trees in good harmony together. You can say on this planet, there would be no terrestrial plants without fungi. They are the basis of terrestrial plant life. So they help trees grow even in harsh conditions. They can be counted as highways for water and nutrient transport, let's say horizontal transport in arid soils. They have a big function for cleaning polluted soil. They even um, destruct petrochemicals or they can absorb radiation. And new scientific data and new approaches in medicine show that they have a big, big function as medicine for cancer, depression, addiction, for many diseases. So fungi seems to be the basis of the natural web, as I said, the flow of nutrients, information, and water in a forest is done by the fungi below the ground. If we go on in the web of nature, we go to the web of animal species. Uh, let's say, if you believe me, 
how the use of glyphosate in rural India can cause malaria in cities of Africa. So again, a connection between rural areas and uh, urban areas over a very large distance. The complexity of this web is highly, still highly underestimated by most people. Recent findings show, give a bit a clue of how this web functions. Maybe one of the most known or most famous examples is the journey of the monarch butterfly. You can hear, see here this little butterfly um, and his travel throughout the continent of Northern America between the three countries, Canada, USA, and Mexico. Butterflies need three to five generations each year to fulfill their migration. They travel up to 4,000 kilometers. Their winter habitat is in Mexico. That's where each winter all monarch butterflies go. This little habitat, we talk about 100 million butterflies. It, in 1996, it was measured as an 18 hectare small forest. In 2013, only 1.67 hectares of this forest remains. It's the only winter habitat for the monarch butterfly. In this winter habitat, which is a forest, the water for the for Mexico for parts of Mexico City is produced or let's say filtered. So this habitat is also important for urban area. And the monarch falsa seems to be, monarch butterfly seems to be a pollinator for a whole continent. And another connection to urban spaces is shown here from National Geographic. Monarch butterflies are dying out. Here's how cities can help. So people in USA started to plant the food milkweed um, in urban areas to help this butterfly migrate. The next story of the animal web are migratory birds. A new world record of birds nonstop flight was measured just two months ago. Limosa Lapunica is the name of this beautiful bird. It traveled 12,000 km from Alaska to New Zealand nonstop. The bird also travels from Europe to Africa, crossing Romania. It has a sister bird, let's say, Galinago Media, and it has a connection to the bird flu. So in January 2020, there was a bird flu outbreak in Romania, and thousands of chickens had to be killed for safety reasons in Baia Mare. The source of the virus is not the bird migration, it's the factory farming of a, a big density of birds together. But the migratory birds, if they land and they get affected, then they spread the flu. A lot of scientists also say that about the COVID-19 virus that we and me uh, experienced those days. Next animal species I want to show you are the wandering glider and its connection to malaria. The wandering glider is a dragonfly that travels a lot. The migration can be up to 7,000 km. It is just voted recently as Germany's dragonfly of the year 2021, as it uh, migrated also to Germany recently. It feeds on tsetse and mosquito flies. So now we come closer to the malaria topic. And if the population is harmed in India, let's say, because um, in rural areas there, let's say glyphosate is used um, in agriculture, it has direct effects on malaria outbreaks in Africa. You can measure that. Here you can see a map how it 
wonders how it migrates from India to Africa and back. The wandering glider follows a river in the sky. It is water in the sky, let's say. It is the clouds. You can see another image of an art documentation. This is the water river I'm talking about. So coming to rivers on the ground for cities, the best flood protection are wild rivers in general. You see here an image of the Vyosa in Albania. It's our last large wild river of Europe. There's no dam from, from its spring to the ocean. But of course, there are hundreds of dams planned. There is a discussion, let's say, or a fight going on if those if this um, river will be dammed due to um, renew, renewable energy production. Here in Switzerland, you can see that um, most Western countries are going back the other way around. It's in the Rhine and the Alpine mountains in um, Switzerland. Um, the the dam were opened again, so the, the river is flowing wild again due to flood protection of the cities that you can see here behind in the background of the image. So if you go deeper into rivers and wild rivers, especially, you see it's not only a one-way traffic. Um, in the image, you can see that cold water is running downstream, but warm water is on the same time running upstream. So we had Nabu, um, Byland, and try and Germ try to open the rivers again to get this natural flow back to our land. Short um, fact about Nabu, as Rebecca already said, we are one of the biggest um, German nature protection um, associations. And I'm working for Nabu Foundation for National Nature Heritage. And we care about the land that is owned by Nabu. Here you can see a map of our areas. We have, unfortunately, only about 20, uh, 21,000 hectares, but we will reach to the bigger number. <laughs> it's in 315, we call it natural paradises. Our main aim is the long-term protection of high nature values. And as we also heard yesterday, nature protections means protection of natural processes. How we do it? We do it as Kupas. Here are our areas in 2004. Each year we buy a bit more. 2005, 2006, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So in the end, in this special example, in 15 years, we bought 470 hectares. We made 122 sales, sales contracts um, to give this land back to natural processes. This is the graph of our, the green line shows the, the areas that is protected by NABU now. So 21,000 years each year, a bit more. It's shortly about Germany's wilderness potential. You, one can say there are there are big potentials to do wilderness areas, but if you go deeper, there's another spider waving a web. You can see the roads of this county of Germany, then the train, electricity. So in the end, you see there are not many areas left, big areas that are not cut by streets or um, trains. The nodes alone do not result in a network. Um, it's also important to care about the cords that form and carry the web. I would say we can cross borders easily as landscapers, so we should be the cords. 
Also, social networking helps to form the web. And that's another project that um, Rebecca and me and a lot of international friends uh, started some years ago for raising awareness also in rural Romania, which is a connection now to your Azov. Um, we founded the little association Chat Fortress, and we just do um, projects in one rural village that is called Movile, the, or 100 Bücher in, in German language, the village of the Hundred Hills. Here you can see just an impression. This is the fortified church, the Biserica Fortificate we care about. We do projects, we bring urban people to this very rural Transylvanian village. Here you can see an image of 35 Berlin youngsters that for their mind visit another planet when they come to Movile. We also invite urban landscapers to travel in time and experience the life in Movile and we want to reconnect. And here you can even find a mega city in Movile if you look deeper. So I would be happy to see some of you visiting us in Movile. Here you can find the address of our little association. And I say thank you for your attendance. Thank you, Jonas. Uh, um, I wanted to tell more about uh, this uh, when we have uh, the break and you finish the presentation about uh, uh, the landscape and about uh, what you do in Abu and uh, what should we be aware of and how we should be understanding actually the process that is behind the tree and how it works in nature or in urban areas. So thank you very much for uh, um, uh, relating to this. Uh, and uh, I wanted to keep the surprise with Movila, but you <laughs> you yeah. already presented. Now, I, uh, I'm happy that you did that. Um, uh, I wanted to tell the people why is that uh, you're actually talking so well in Romanian, <laughs> uh, that you've been spending a lot of time actually in, uh, in Romania because you're developing uh, this project uh, in Movila which is actually uh, really nice. And um, what I want to tell about this project is that uh, there are many landscape architects involved and uh, many workshops uh, already happened there. Uh, and um, I still remember something that you were saying uh, over there, just because we are talking now about our country, uh, is about the biodiversity that we still have in that village, uh, on our, uh, in that hills uh, from, uh, from Ovila. And um, uh, Jonas, uh, with another um, uh, members of the team, uh, they did a very in intense study of, uh, of the landscape over there. So he knows uh, many, many things about uh, the, the biodiversity and uh, the landscape that we have in the middle of our country. Uh, I'm going to uh, now uh, try to see what uh, type of questions do we have uh, over here, and uh, we get some. So I'm going to address you the first uh, the first question. Um, what is your impression of how wild uh, Romania is from uh, what you know about the local uh, biodiversity? What are uh, the risk uh, risk uh, you see from the point of uh, view? Uh, as uh, as we are on uh, on the right track, uh, do we progress? Do we progress? Do we preserve, uh, protect, or uh, are we uh, destructive? Uh, your your feedback is, uh, will be much appreciated. Sorry for uh, not seeing uh, so well the message. Uh, so somebody wants to know if uh, we destroy or we protect our nature uh, and about our biodiversity from Romania. Jonas? Yeah, I mean, it's both. I, I would say you cannot answer either or. There are a lot of people trying to protect nature. I would mention the organization Carpathia, for example. Um, um, a nice couple um, that started to buy also land in the Fogarash mountain reach um, in order to protect it from being clear-cutted. Um, till now, they even only in a 
few years, let's say in 15, 15 years, they also have enough power to employ ranger that go every day out in the um, virgin forest um, to protect it. Um, I, I, well, you know it better than me probably about um, the discussion in Romania. Um, how to protect those forests. As far as I know, only in Eastern Poland and in Romania, you can speak of really virgin forests in Europe. Forests that have, have never been used on a, um, on, on a big scale, let's say, um, of human beings. So this is a treasure that you should keep. And I see that the, that the awareness is rising um, very fast. Thanks for this uh, for this answer. Uh, I think we we wanted to all, all to hear uh, that we are uh, still on time to do something. At least um, we still have some uh, some lands that are not touched or destroyed yet. Uh, so uh, uh, maybe again, the first. Sorry, again, it's unique in in Europe. Um, only Poland and Romania. Uh, so, for, uh, at least in something, we are the first uh, ones, uh, we and uh, Poland, <laughs> uh, we are uh, uh, having something on which we exceed. So, um, that's, uh, that's good to know. So, uh, we can build uh, our, uh, our cities and our new connections uh, on, uh, on, uh, on what we already have here and... Um, for sure, this is going to influence uh, the issues that we are going to deal with in the cities uh, and in the uh, areas where uh, people are living in Romania. So I'm going to pass uh, to the next question that I have here for you. How do you think uh, we can uh, tackle the issue of uh, invasive uh, species? I refer uh, to insects mostly. To insects? Probably uh, I'm assuming the person is referring to mosquitoes or uh, to uh, the platanus uh, tiger, if you know that uh, a new bee, that uh, new insect that appeared in our uh, cities. So also here, I would not say there is one answer to the big topic of invasive species. Um, you have to really look at the species and at the ecology of the species. Mm. Often, if you have an invasive species and it's spreading and it's harming um, the ecosystem, it is a sign for us that the ecosystem was weak before. So normally in resilient ecosystems, the invasive species don't count a big role. Of course, there are some examples that um, do not fit to, to my answer, but then you really have to look at the, at the ecology of this um, certain species. The, it is the same topic with wilderness. I mean, we landscape planners and when landscape architects want to do something, <laughs> but often nature can do it better <laughs> um, and there are some good examples um, that if you don't do anything for 10 years but just try to make the ecosystem more resilient so don't, don't fight against the special um, species only protect the land and only give it back its quality then those invasive species shrink in their population or they don't have this big effect. But of course, there are some other examples and it's big discussion um, uh, also in, uh, um, in ecological um, groups. Um, I want to ask you if you can explain a bit uh, more. Uh, what do you refer when you're uh, talking about the ecology of a species? of a species, because uh, probably most of our uh, uh, people, the people that are watching us maybe don't understand exactly what do we refer exactly. 
Can you tell us more about uh, this? Yeah, um, mostly it's about the food. What do they eat? And about the time or condition of reproducing and about um, the change of their behavior due to um, predators. So normally predators don't directly um, reduce or, or let's say influence the population in its number, but they mostly influence the, the uh, prey in its behavior. Um, a good example is Yellowstone in, in USA, where they where they uh, brought the wolf again there, and the whole landscape changed because of the reintroduction of the wolf, um, because the the deer changed its behavior. Let's say, um, so the river started to be open again. The forest um, could regrow in a higher density, like that. So analyze the the, the food. What does the invasive species eat? Analyze how they reproduce and analyze which predators they have. And often you find um, a, a way to affect, let's say, the population of invasive species by that. Thank you. So, so, uh, so good to know, actually. Um, I have to admit I, I wasn't... Uh, um, I didn't know about uh, about uh, these um, these things that you were saying, but uh, I'm happy that I found out. Uh, I'm going to uh, go to the other question that we have uh, over here. So, uh, in encouraging wilderness uh, in our lives, uh, do you think we need a suitable uh, legislative uh, framework, or we need uh, to educate more the large uh, public, or both are equal important? So. <laughs> mm. Yeah, we need a framework, but I personally think the awareness, raising the awareness um, in people, in, in the human beings um, has a more stable effect. And this is what's going on currently now all over the world that the that the awareness of Mother Nature, of the, those um, interconnections in nature, um, they are a quality again. They are something that um, should be protected again. And if people know about it and talk about it, then it's and it spreads in society, then it's much more stable, much more effective as if you just put a legislative frame on that can be um, be changed again due to political all day daily um, reasons. If another party comes to power and they have another approach, then they just easily kick it away. But if the if the society has it in in, in the mind, then you cannot change it that easily. Uh, that is so true. What uh, what you were uh, you were mentioning over here. Um, I uh, just wanted to uh, ask you another question. Uh, if uh, it would be now to give an advice for Romania for uh, for all the specialists from here, uh, how they should uh, uh, should deal with uh, with the facts that we are facing now regarding our. Um, Regarding our nature in uh, in towns in uh, in our lives uh, in in the uh, neighborhood, um, what advice would you give us? I I don't know if I if I can advise um, the Romanian people what to do, <laughs> but um, to my experience. Um, uh, talk about it, mention it, post it on Facebook. Um, go out in the nature, do your wonderful experience. If you feel this connection or if you deepen your connection, if you see the music, if you feel the music of uh, wilderness, for example, um, you spread this emotion and you, you um, affect other people. I, I think almost every human being um, has a sense for 
Madhya, which is more than just quantitative scientific data, but it's this connection. And if you talk about it, if you post it, um, you affect more and more people. But it's one approach. It's not the. It's not the. Um, all total advice for all Romanian people. It's my my experience and what I would do. Thank you so much, uh, Jonas. Uh, thank you for uh, showing us uh, um, from your experience uh, and sharing this with us. Uh, thank you for answering to to our questions. Um, um, I need to go forward because of time, so to keep uh, track on time. But I uh, kindly invite you to stay with us uh, till the end, so you can uh, can be part uh, here. And uh, <laughs> uh, thanks a lot.